Thank you all very much for coming to this afternoon's talk on advanced global illumination in Unity 5. My name is Jim Cheney. I am the engineering manager at GMRX. That means that I'm responsible for the development and the delivery and the maintenance of the Enlighten SDK. We split this talk into three 15-minute sections, along with 15 minutes for questions at the end. I will be ably assisted later by Kasper Engelstoft from Unity Technologies. He's going to be talking about how the Unity integration works, and how you drive it today, and the new features that will be coming in the near future. And our headline act is Adam Suminar from Invive Studios, who has some marvelous work that really takes the best out of Enlighten and uh, can show you some really beautiful aspects of what you can do in your games. So despite the fact that this is a talk about advanced global illumination, it makes sense to start with the basics. For the purposes of this talk, I'm splitting the, ver the, the phases of lighting into basically three sections. Uh, direct lighting is what's the general input lighting and shadowing. Indirect lighting is what we're really talking about today. That's the, the bounce lighting that is used to fill a scene. And then there's camera dependent or other reflections and highlights, which I'm lumping together under the term specular. And these are all combined together in the final shader to give you your composite scene. To be as absolutely clear as possible on this, uh, this is a scene from something in 2013. You can see there's a bright directional light in the upper right corner, and there is a small torch light on the uh, left hand side. So the direct pass only shows the immediate uh, input light, and it's very limited. It's a very dark screen behind me. And this is the effect of running that same scene through Enlighten. There's obviously a significant more bounce. And you can see all the detail, the, the bridge, the tunnel, everything's going into. The specular pass is fairly bright in this. One assumes that the rocks are quite wet and therefore have a good strong highlights. And when we combine them all together in the final image, you see the, the, the full impact of lighting the scene where a fully di dynamic GI. It is worth noting uh, that we've actually done a little bit of a cheat. Uh, and the, the torch on the far left side of the screen is actually putting out a lot more light than it should. Uh, although Enlighten is a physically correct solution, it is possible to break the laws of physics when you need to and actually make some bounces or some light sources more powerful than they should be. It's all about getting the correct lighting environment for your game. But I'm here initially to talk about the Enlighten solution and how it works. Um, the fundamentals of Enlighten is that it's a bounce transfer. Light falls on a surface, and a certain proportion of it is reflected off into the other environment. And it continues to bounce like this until we reach a converged steady state. Now, I warn you, I realize this is an art talk, but for the next two slides, there's going to be some maths involved. So just not that much maths. This is way, way too much. This is far more than anybody expected to know. Um, to be honest with you, I had to look up on Wikipedia what half the terms in this equation mean. But this is what's generally the correct way of lighting a scene. It includes all of the different aspects of surface transfer and BRDFs and so forth. And there is no way that we can do this in real time. A much simpler version is the radiosity solution or the discrete solution. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So I'm going to walk you through the important parts of it right now. We're solving an individual patch, also known as a cluster. And the brightness, B, is what we're trying to calculate. And that is. All the sum of, that's the little E symbol, uh, of all of the lights it patches it can see, that's LJ, multiplied by how important they are. The, the more of your field of view it takes up, the more impact it will have. There's a certain number of these that's known as the budget. And the budget is a parameter that's exposed via Unity. And it's quite important for the performance and quality trade-offs that you need to make. When we've collected all these lights together, we may find that it's overall a strong blue light, but we need to multiply it by the material properties of the surface. This is the rho, or P, if you prefer. Um, the, there's no point having a strong blue light on a red surface, because it's not actually going to bounce any light. And finally, we simply add any emissive term directly to the output. That solves one patch. We solve it for every patch in the world. And then we crank the handle, and we do it again. And we crank the handle and do it again. Now, this solution is entirely independent of the frame rate of your game. So you can run it on background threads. You can spread out the load. You can solve different areas at different frequencies. 
For a more visual version of it, this is exactly the same thing, but flattened down to two dimensions. The pixel we're trying to solve is at the bottom, and it sees three different regions with a different level of importance, depending on how much of its field of view is taken up. And depending on the colors of regions A, B, and C, gives you a final composite color for your output pixel. Fundamentally, this is the core of the Enlightened runtime and what makes it work. But why do we care about this? The fundamentals of being able to change the lighting environment and changing the material properties gives you brand new gameplay opportunities. Uh, Adam will show later what they can do with a simple day-night cycle and a beautifully laid out uh, scenery with clean, crisp lines. If you don't want to uh, drive your entire product around this dynamic GI, that's absolutely fine. You still get the benefits of a really fast iteration time in the editor. And another point that we come back to later, emissive surfaces are free. You've seen where they fit into the equation. They're going to be added in even if the value is zero. Every single cluster in your world can emit a different disco-colored light, and it will cost you nothing in terms of performance. And if your final target hardware is a bit under constrained, you can always bake this stuff out to textures and leave it static. So if that's the runtime, then what are the processes that go on that actually make this stuff possible? Well, fundamentally, Enlighten requires that the world be mostly static. Because in order to cal calculate what patches can see what other patches, we need to ensure that it's not constantly changing at runtime. So for the purposes of showing this, this is an example scene that we took to GDC this year. Um, it's not particularly novel or exciting, but the main things to take note is, again, there's a strong directional light coming in from the upper left corner. Uh, there's an emissive exit sign, and there's a soft glow coming out of the room. Now, the first stage in any of this offline processing is to actually pack the UVs, to create the atlas that we need to light the scene. Now, Enlighten has automated tools to do this. It's termed auto UVs. And the purpose is to find the largest possible area that it can project a plane onto while processing the minimum amount of error. Uh, in other words, it tries to find flat surfaces. And it does this by pressing down on objects so that a, a small object like this clicker or the laptop on that uh, lectern will become part of the UV layout for the overall map. If this isn't doing what you want, you have the option to preserve UVs. So that requires you to lay out a non-overlapping charts in your own UV stream. Once your charts have been identified, you need to specify the output pixel size. Now, irradiance, or this reflected light, is a very low frequency. It's very soft. It's very blended. So you're looking at output pixel size for a, a human interactive environment in the order of a meter or so. It's important to make this decision carefully because it makes a significant impact on how much runtime data is being generated. And it will make your pre-compute take longer. Again, as always, you're balancing qu uh, your quality with the performance and memory. This is the chart layout for that particular scene you saw. The different colored regions are separate UV blocks. And the, the checkerboard overlay is the size of a pixel. You can also see that those statues are in a blue highlight. This is because they're probe-lit objects. The next stage in the process is what's termed clustering. Uh, this is where we're slicing the world up into these patches, known as clusters. And we build a tree of all the clusters that have a similar view of the world. Remember, all light input and all light transfer is from cluster to cluster. And these clusters are usually defined in terms of an output pixel size. Uh, and for this case, I've used one that's twice the size of a pixel. This means that the patches are fairly large compared to the world around them. But they're collecting an aggregate view of what they can see and transferring the light from frame to frame. This screenshot, for the particularly sharp eye of you, you can actually notice that the probe-lit objects are included in the bouncing solution. This is an Enlightened 302 feature, which will be coming shortly into uh, Unity. And this is the same view, but now instead of fake colors, we're actually using the input lighting. Um, a strong directional white light is landing on the floor, lightening up those clusters. And I've, in this particular example, using some debug tools, I've stopped it after just one frame. So you can see that there is a gray, like, single bounce transfer onto the back wall. But it hasn't really had time to actually fill in uh, the, the floor, the part that it didn't hit. As the handle gets cranked, so the light went even out, and it can take a millisecond or two to stabilize. One of the longest bits of calculation that needs to be done offline is what's called the light transport. 
And this is where we work out by ray tracing how, uh, sorry, which ones of the many, many clusters in the world each cluster can see. And the accuracy of this solution is defined by the quality. The quality parameter in the Unity UI defines how many rays are being cast for every sample point we place in the world. It almost doesn't matter past a certain point how accurate this picture is, because the very next thing we do is take a cut through the world and decide which ones are the most important and which ones we're going to keep. And that budget ties directly into the memory footprint of your final title, how many entries need to be added up, and therefore how long it takes. So that's how the data is created and then generated and used. Uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly on the particular outputs of the scene. I've shown you the irradiance texture. Uh, this is the uh, diffuse lighting. We also have a directionality texture, which is storing the direction that each individual color is coming from, along with an intensity, how, how spread out it is in that direction. This is necessary because specular highlights and so forth require a camera-dependent lookup. These different data streams are combined in the different data models that Unity provides. And the more complex the model, the more data it uses, and the more expensive it is. And Casper will be taking you through some really good examples of that shortly. Other than textures, the other main output is probes. And probes work in a very similar way in the runtime, but they're not transferring light from anywhere else. But they see these clusters. And for every probe point, we spin through the cluster that can see and how important they are, multiply the values together, and so forth. The final output is what's termed spherical, spherical harmonic coefficients. Fundamentally, that means that we store an individual R, G, and B channel. We say how intense the light is and what direction it's coming from. So for this scene, there's a very regular, far too dense grid of probes to prove the point. Um, but the largest one that you can see in the upper left-hand side has a blue tint coming from the environment, a nice blue sky. And it has a brown tint from underneath, where you're getting a nice bounce from the white light off of the solid oak floor. And that's it for my part of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to welcome onto the stage Kasper Engelstoft, who will be talking you through the uh, Unity integration and what's coming next. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Good work, Tyler. Hi, everyone. My name is Casper, and I work in the Unity office in Copenhagen. I'm part of the lighting team, where we work on the lighting integration. We do light probes, shadows, general lighting, reflection probes. And today, I'm going to talk about how we integrate in lighting into Unity, and some of the features that we have that, that are useful to you, and a bit about what's coming next. So what you can do in uh, Unity 5 compared to Unity 4 is uh, we have this new system based on Enlighten that we use to either bake light maps in the editor or have dynamic lighting in the player. So you can have baked GI, and you can have static light probes, or you can have pre-computed real-time GI, which is used to deliver light maps and light probes that can actually change in the player. And we have the baked and real-time reflection probes. But I'm not going to talk much, uh, much about reflection probes today. If you're really interested in this, I suggest that you have a look at um, Kuba and, 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 and my talk from GDC this year, where we went into a lot of details about convolution and screen space reflections and a lot of other cool stuff. But you can combine all these three systems in, in any way you like. You can have fully baked lighting if you're on a, on a low-end mobile, or you can have the real-time pre-computed GI on, uh, on a console, or you can combine all of them using reflections. So you can combine them as you see fit. And this shot shows our blacksmith demo from GDC. And you have this really nice, soft, indirect lighting underneath the bridge. And it shows that indirect lighting does a lot for this scene. And uh, note that this is actually, you're able to update it in real time when you change the skylight. And this goes for uh, any of the, uh, of the changes that affect your lighting setup. So it means you, once you're done with the pre-calculation in, in the editor, you can change lights, you can add them, you can remove them. You can actually also change the albedo and the emission of any surface 
by using something we call a, a meta shader pass that I'll go into details with later on. But you can also change it uh, in a more uh, simple way using an API for, uh, for changing, for instance, an emission color, which is uh, a really fast way of, uh, of making uh, area lights. You can also freely change the whole sky dome, which opens up for uh, day and night effects, so you can have a dynamic time of day. And how did we do this? Well, from Unity's 3 and 4 to, to 5, we changed the lighting workflow completely, where we now hash all the inputs that affect the GI. This means that we can uh, keep track whatever you're changing in the editor. We pick up the changes and we calculate new outputs that we store in something we call the GI cache. It's a, a big collection of files where we, we store what is coming in and we evict the older stuff. And it means that if you close down the editor or stop the bake, we can actually pick up where we left off and, um, and we just load all the stuff that we cached. We also have the option of going really wide on this because we can calculate many of these in parallel. So we can distribute work to all the CPUs and we have an external process that, uh, that, can, that we can use to execute these jobs. And we also have the option of going even wider using the, the network to distribute this work. And it's something we've been working on at, at a hack week. And we have a proof of, proof of concept, but it takes some more work before we can actually roll it out. So uh, please be patient on this. We're working on it. Since we now store and cache all this stuff outside of the actual assets, we don't dirty the scene anymore like we did in, uh, in Unity 4. And it also opens up for this new interactive mode where we change on the fly. Or you can just hit the bake button and wait for it to complete. And we save all these. Uh, this GI data that Enlighten uses in something we call a light map snapshot, which you can version in your assets folder. And lighting in the editor, you control that in the lighting window where we gathered all the different inputs. And here you can uh, set the resolution, which is the first important step of, uh, of getting an ice bake. Set a resolution that makes sense, and then consider the default parameters. If you have a really large scene like the size of Amsterdam, you probably don't want the default parameters. And you can try and, and use our default low resolution, for instance. If you, if you have a really detailed scene, maybe just one tiny room, you should consider making a new default parameter where you crank up all the options. You can also set these options per object in the Object tab. So if you have an object that you want to fine tune, get some more quality, put it into a special light map, you can set different, these different uh, parameter sets. And on the left side here, there's a, a light map parameters, an example that I made. And, and the, um, the options that Jim mentioned with the uh, irradiance budget, irradiance quality, you can set these here so you directly control the inputs to Enlighten. So some of these affect the, uh, the pre-compute, some of them affect the runtime cost. And we also have some, uh, some more Unity specific settings like the bake tag. Bake tag will force the object into a specific atlas, which is useful if you want to control exactly what you want to put in, in each atlas. And we have some, uh, some upcoming view modes, just like we have the albedo view, irradiance view, and so on. This is the clustering view, so it shows the, the clusters that Enlighten generates, which will be available uh, hopefully in 5.2 if, uh, if everything works out. So this will load all the clustering data from the GI cache and show you uh, how the scene is subdivided. And we also have the input lighting view mode where you can see how the, the, the lit clusters look. And this is the enlightened view of the scene. In this case, it's a green quad that emits some light into the scene, and you can see how it's, how it's distributed. For the different light mapping, mapping modes, we have a trade-off between quality and performance. And by quality, I don't mean the, uh, the typical resolution, but actually the effects that you can achieve, which can be normal mapped or not, and view-dependent lighting, which uh, can give you specular. And it's a trade-off both on the memory side and on the shader performance side. The non-directional mode is what we usually refer to as static baked light map. It's diffuse. It's just a single light map. It stores information about how much light is leaving the surface for a specific pixel. And objects that you light this way will be purely diffuse. There's no specular. But you can add real-time specular on top of it. 
but uh, this is usually good for mobile, so you probably don't have performance to do that if, if you go with this route. Instead, you should consider the directional mode, which has twice the memory footprint, because we store both a light map for the incoming dominant light direction, and we store this factor about how much light is leaving the surface and how much is, of it is actually coming from the dominant direction. The rest of the light is assumed to be purely diffuse, so you will get normal mapping, but you will not get any specular. And this is also relatively cheap to do in the shader, but you pay for an extra texture lookup and some more, uh, some more math. Directional specular is the, is the highlight of these because it allows for full shading. We have two light maps like in directional mode, but this time we actually store incoming light intensity and some extra information so we can run the full BIDF evaluation both for the direct lighting and for the indirect lighting. So you can actually get specular for the indirect lighting. So uh, you can get the highest quality possible. And there's quite a lot of shader code getting executed because of the BRDF evaluation. So uh, this, is, uh, this is for high-end platforms. And it also means that we ha because we have these two textures that are mirrored into a left and a right side for direct and indirect, it means we have four times the memory footprint. The meter pass that I talked about is super useful because the way an object looks is defined by its shader. And normally you think about this as what you get on screen, but we actually separated this out so that the light mapper has its own shader. In Unity 3 and 4, we had a simple mapping from some specific tags, and we did some string matching and spe special material properties. And it worked most of the time, but it was hard coded and you couldn't really do custom surfaces. So in Unity 5, we rendered this at two, as two different passes that runs in light map space. And this is executed on the GPU, so you can't do bakes uh, without a GPU, basically. What we can do with this is to easily customize how a surface looks, and you can even do completely uh, custom procedural effects if you want. So you can render lighting into the emission buffer, or you can render different things into the albedo, which completely changes how light is bouncing in the scene. And this is also how we do with the standard shader. It actually has a meter pass internally, where we use the, the metalness of the surface to, to control how much uh, light is bouncing off the surface, because physically correct metal will not really bounce any light diffusely, because, well, it's all specular. But because Enlighten only handles diffuse transport, then we crank up the, uh, the value a bit. We bias it towards a brighter color with the hue of the metal, and we get some bounce off, this, off, the, uh, off the metal. And it, uh, it adds a bit to the scene, but you can do your own meter pass if you want to be um, physically correct in, in this way. And this is a, a demo of uh, the standard shader, where I added a custom meter pass. And now I inject orange light into the scene, and you can see how the, uh, the light bouncing on the, on the temple is changing. You can also add a, a different texture. In this case, uh, you can actually see how the texels look to enlighten. It's pretty low resolution, but uh, this means that you can, um, you can make some really interesting effects, and you can actually change this at runtime, because we, we, we render this on the GPU. And you can also use the fast emission path if you, for instance, just want to change a specific uh, color. It's, it's much faster to change this in script than, than using the full meter pass. But if you want to get these uh, interesting effects, I suggest you try this out. It's really useful for changing how the bounce lighting look without changing the, the look of the, of the normally rendered scene. And if you want to see the shader, it's available in, uh, in the slide deck. So for 5.2 alpha, we have a new nice feature about where we can additively load baked lighting data, which means that you can uh, piece together levels if you want to do procedural levels that has uh, enlightened data in it. And you can do it in two ways. You can bake everything together, or you can bake it in separate chunks. Either way, you load it up by calling a load level additive, and we will merge the enlightened data in the runtime. But there are some limitations. If you bake things separately, you can't get baked lighting that is cast from one scene chunk to the other. You can only get that if you bake everything together. It also means that uh, you won't get any uh, emission from one scene chunk to the other if they're separated. But 
you will you'll probably have to do some other tricks if you do fully procedural levels anyway for, for connecting the different segments. Right now, light probes are not 100% supported. We have this one big cloud of, of light probes that are loaded together with, scene, with the first scene. So if you bake everything together, you will get all the light probes in the beginning. But this is something we'll work on. But uh, for those of you on the alpha list, I highly recommend that you take a look at it and, and give us some feedback on how it's working. What we're also working on is the Enlighten upgrade. We've been running with 2.22 for a while now. And Enlighten 3.2 brings some performance upgrades in the clustering phase, which means that you will get faster baking once we complete this upgrade. Final gather is also split out into a separate stage already. And this will open up for some more improvements in, uh, in final gather moving forward. But uh, no ETA on, on that specific thing. That's not part of 302. So we intend to add these new nice Enlightened 3.2 features like uh, real-time transparency, which allows you to remove objects at runtime. So you can have doors that open. You can have frosted glass. And you can destroy stuff. And uh, we also have nice uh, cube maps, which are faster and better quality. And this is an, uh, this is an alternative to the uh, real-time reflection probes because uh, they are lower resolution, but they can be much faster because we don't have to render the scene six times for one probe. And another important change is the probe-lit objects. Right now, they're not visible to Enlighten, but in, uh, when we upgrade to Enlighten 3, they will actually be available in the clustering phase so you can emit light from a probe-lit object into the GI solution. And light probes, they just point in space. And in Unity, we, we uh, take this point cloud and do something that's called tetrahedralization. So we make uh, this spatial representation of how to, uh, that we use to interpolate and extrapolate the lighting data. So it means don't do a regular grid of light probes. Do something that makes a nice tetrahedra. And uh, you should also avoid these really long, thin tetra heater. It's better to have something that's, that's a, a more regular triangle, but not a grid. And consider using light probes for small objects, because that will uh, remove it from the pre-compute, and it will make your scene bake a lot faster. And small objects don't contribute much to the scene anyway. Adam is going to go into details about how he, he did this division for his game called Pamela, and it's really cool. So first of all, remember to set a real-time resolution that makes sense. So once you have the, the overall resolution of your scene nailed, then you can start uh, cranking it up and get, get the nice effects. It's because it's no fun waiting 18 hours for a huge racetrack level to bake. And then you find out that, OK, I actually wanted to, to have a, a much lower resolution in the end. Use the fast emission API if you want to do emissive lighting with a constant color. Use the meta pass if you want to do something more procedural, something more interesting, something that uses a lookup texture or any other kind of shader that you can imagine. Another obvious uh, effect is to add lights to player control objects, to particles, and so on, because you can emit light into the GI solution, even from a real-time light. And finally, as, as Jim said, area lights are free. If you use emissive, they act as area lights. And uh, Adam, he will, uh, he will go through how he uses uh, area lights. His game Pamela is a prime example of how to get a really great looking game using uh, just emission as area lights. So I would like to welcome uh, Adam Simonov from uh, Envive Studios. Thank you. Okay, Awesome. Well, it's a real honor to be up here in front of all you guys. Uh, big thanks to Geomerix and Unity for uh, having me up here. Uh, last year, I was out in the audience uh, the last few nights, you know, trying to soak up as much info as I could. So, uh, switch a slide here. So, hopefully, uh, what I'm going to share with you guys today is going to be uh, is going to be helpful. Um, so, I'm Adam Simonar. I'm the studio director and level designer at Envive Studios, uh, working on Pamela. Um, just purely for my curiosity, can I get a show of hands? Uh, who is familiar with Pamela before this talk? Okay, so a couple people. Cool, that's awesome. Um, 
Right, so Pamela is an open world survival horror game. Uh, we have a huge environment for players to explore, a real time day night cycle. Uh, we have a clean sci fi setting uh, that we're working with. So, lighting is a really important part of, uh, of what we do. Um, a little bit of background on the studio. Uh, we used to do, well, not used to, we, uh, we still do, um, but our background is in architectural visualization. Um, so, then again, lighting has always been an important aspect of what we do. Uh, so I'm going to go over a couple of the uh, design challenges that we faced in building this game, uh, and then I'm going to get into some kind of uh, technical tips and, and uh, best practices. So my first point here is light and form. Uh, this sounds a little bit artsy, uh, maybe, um, but when you're working with an environment and a art style like this where it's very clean, uh, smooth shapes, lighting really plays an important role in, uh, in really telling your environment story. Um, so the way we kind of approach level design uh, is lighting is very much a part of the process. So we're modeling, bringing that into Unity, testing out the lighting, seeing how it spills, you know, across the scene. Um, it's, so it's very much like a back and forth process. And the fact that now Enlighten is allowing us to do dynamic, uh, dynamic GI, we're not having these, you know, crazy hours and hours of iteration cycles just try, trying to see how our scene reacts with some, you know, uh, extra windows you might have added into it. Um, you can really feel the light. You know, you can see in this uh, example here, you feel the sunlight really kind of coming into the scene and sort of uh, lighting it up in a way that's really awesome and it would be very difficult to fake without this kind of technology. Uh, so as I said earlier, we have a day and night cycle. Uh, traditionally, this is in, in like an exterior setting like uh, Rust, for example. Uh, this kind of thing can be done really, really nicely uh, without even really needing necessarily real-time GI in your environment because it's mostly ambient light that's kind of telling most of the story. In Pamela, we have a lot of interior scenes, as you're seeing here. Uh, it's, it's a mostly enclosed area. So faking the, uh, the aspect of GI in these scenes uh, with you know, in Unity 4 and 3 would be extremely difficult. Um, as well, you can, uh, you can notice in this clip here we have this kind of emissive uh, tube that comes across the ceiling that starts out as blue during the day. Now you can see it shift to, uh, to kind of an ominous orange. So that's all, uh, that's all done through dynamic uh, emissive materials. That's all changing in real time. Um, as uh, Jim and Casper already went over, that's, uh, that's a really cheap thing to do, and it looks really great. And this kind of effect uh, would be really difficult to fake. I mean, you could maybe put point lights, you know, all along that, that strip there, but that's going to get pretty expensive and that's going to be pretty difficult to, uh, to work with. So this really opened up a lot of opportunities for us in terms of the way we light our levels. Uh, and the last point I want to make is uh, on player controlled lighting. So. Uh, in, in Pamela, we allow the players to actually influence the game's lighting. So you can turn on the power in an area to sort of brighten it up and make it a, a safer place to be uh, at the cost of you're going to drain the, the city's power resources down. So it was really important to us that we have this as an option for the player. But again, uh, without the ability to do this all dynamically in real time, without placing again maybe hundreds or maybe thousands of point lights in the scene, uh, it's a tough proposition. So the lighting you're seeing here uh, is a few emissive strips. Uh, just, it's just geometry, just modeled and imported into the engine um, that we're updating in real time. And you, you get these really nice soft, uh, you know, soft fall offs of the light. And again, it's very cheap. Essentially, when you're not updating it, it's basically free. So if you're not updating the lighting like we are, uh, you can do the same kind of thing, and it's going to be extremely, extremely uh, cheap to do rather than using uh, traditional dynamic lights. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start with looking a little bit at the geometry kind of creation and importing and, uh, and setup. Um, so as you're kind of modeling and, and designing your level, uh, it helps to be thinking like what's going to be static when I bring this into Unity uh, versus what's going to use light probes. That's kind of the, the two major distinctions you want to be focusing on. So generally speaking, only kind of large significant architectural elements should be set as static. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you want to kind of set as few things as static as you possibly can. Uh, the more that's static, the longer your pre-computes are going to take, the more expensive it's going to be. Uh, it might look better, but you, you have to find that trade-off. Um, so you can see in this scene uh, down here at the bottom, we have most of the walls, the floor. Uh, these elements are set as static, and it's kind of dark, so you might not be able to make it out too much. 
But there's, there's benches and there's characters in the scene which are being lit by light probes. Of course, those things shouldn't really be set as static because they're, they're quite small. Um, just as a workflow note, I, I, I recommend using some kind of like uh, naming convention like uh, underscore LMS here, for example, to uh, attach that to all the objects you have that should be static. Just makes it a little bit easier once you get into Unity to, uh, to quickly, uh, you know, say your objects are static. Uh, the, the last thing to keep in mind is which, uh, is what effect an object is going to have in the scene, uh, even if it may be small. So in this example here we have these green, uh, tube lightings near the window. Uh, they're pretty small and if they weren't emissive I probably would have just left them out because they aren't really doing a whole lot or they're not receiving a whole lot of GI. Uh, but they're actually emissive surfaces as you can see in the, the left screenshot there. They're actually casting light into the scene. So for that reason they're left as static even though they themselves are you know, they're not really getting much in the terms of GI. Uh, actually, as Casper uh, said in, in future versions of Unity, you could actually do this same thing without having to set this as static. So those could be like pro blip but still be emissive. So that's a pretty cool new feature coming down the, down the pipe. So performance is like a really, really big uh, topic that could be talked about for a long time. And uh, Casper already went through uh, some, some pretty good notes on this. So I'm going to kind of skim over a little bit here. Um, a couple big things to, to note uh, is for emissive objects that you want to be updating in real time, say I want to update this projector uh, in real time, I want to turn on and off, and I want that to affect the scene, uh, that, that generally should be kept as a separate mesh from everything else. So if you have like the back plate of the projector is metal and the front is emissive, you'd want to make sure that you actually separate that front mesh because when you're updating that emission, if you have it as a multi sub object material, that's going to be updating everything, which kind of leads me to my next point. Casper said this as well, so I'm just going to say it again. Uh, you want to use the dynamic GI dot set emissive uh, function instead of the update materials. Uh, reason being, you can just use a flat color like white or red or, or what have you instead of sampling every single material or every single texture in that material. It's going to be way, way faster in terms of performance. Uh, one of the biggest costs of Enlighten, uh, pr the biggest really cost of Enlighten is the actual updating process. So you want to be careful what lights you are setting as dynamic. Uh, so if you have enemy flashlights, for example, it might be kind of nice to have those set as static because it looks pretty, but when you really think about it, it's probably not the most crucial thing and it's going to be more expensive as you're going to be having more frequent updates, uh, you know, as, as they're walking around and maybe you're not even seeing them, for example. So just be conscious of that. Um, and the last kind of note I have here, not strictly performance but more, uh, more visual is uh, it's, I have a little snippet from, this is Unity's uh, PBR calibration charts which I definitely suggest everyone should uh, take a look at if you're working with materials. Uh, it, it's a good idea to try to stick within the kind of suggested PBR range. Uh, so as you can see here like for a non-metal you theoretically shouldn't ever have anything that's like pure white or pure black. Uh, there's a lot of reasons behind that, but specifically related to Enlighten, uh, if you're pushing those values too far in either direction, it can give you incorrect looking like over, over bounced, you know, light or maybe it's not bouncing any light when you really want it to. So just something to keep in mind uh, if you're noticing your GI is looking a little, you know, a little wonky. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep, deep into the lighting window because Casper did a really great job here. Um, I'm just going to focus on a couple things here. The, the, the main setting you want to be really careful with here is the uh, resolution. Uh, so the resolution is going to be directly related to your uh, final quality. It's also directly related to your pre-compute times and also the actual cost of uh, running and updating Enlighten. So this is going to vary uh, from, from game to game, uh, of course. Uh, I've found generally values uh, like beyond 10, even in a very small scene, it starts to get it starts to blow it and get kind of unmanageable pretty, pretty quickly. So uh, you can experiment with this, but I would suggest trying to be realistic for what game you're making. So if you're working in a huge environment, uh, it, it might be tempting to say, well, I'm going to just try it out with like super high resolution just to see how it looks. It's going to look really great and then you're going to be disappointed when you find out that that's actually not going to work for your game. Um, for example, uh, in, in Pamela we're using a value of two. Uh, Probably we could use one, and that would be okay in most uh, most circumstances. Uh, as Casper said, you can set this on a per object basis as well. Um, I w and I would highly suggest using uh, previs resolutions. So you know you can go as low as 0 0.05 or 0 0.2. Uh, 
Uh, and it's obviously you're going to have a lot of artifacts uh, in your in your pre-compute, but it's usually good enough that you can get an idea like, okay, this is roughly how my scene's looking. Um, so you're not waiting, you know, for potentially hours to just see a small change that you made uh, in your geometry. Uh, and last note here is uh, this is really purely a kind of a personal uh, preference that I've, I've kind of found. Um, indirect intensity and bounce boost, you can kind of, this is basically changing on a global scale how much your, your light's going to be bouncing, how much indirect lighting is coming to your scene. I would usually leave these alone because you can change these settings on a per light basis. Uh, they can give you some interesting effects as well, but they can also lead to, you know, you set this to like two at the beginning and you kind of forget and then you, you wonder, you know, a couple days later why some lights are looking way stronger than you think they should. So uh, I tend to leave them alone. Uh, the directional modes, uh, I'm not going to go over the, I'm not going to do super in depth on this. We're using the directional specular mode, uh, which Casper already explained a lot about the technical side of it. So it's the most expensive uh, out of the gates. So we're targeting Windows PC. So uh, for us, we can we can kind of take this hit. Um, other than the fact that it's more expensive, there is a couple things you should kind of keep keep in mind when you're working with this mode. Uh, out of all of the three modes, it's the most prone to artifacts that are usually due to lower resolution. Uh, so you might end up with a bit of splotchiness occasionally sometimes uh, if you have a say like a flat floor like this uh, and you might have a specular hide on it that could be a little kind of wavy as you're, as you're moving around. It's a little bit hard to describe but if you if you're using like a resolution of one or two you'll probably uh, you know you, you might notice some of these uh, artifacts yourself so you'll have to kind of decide whether you can maybe increase your resolution or maybe it's not going to be a big deal for you. I, in our case it's not usually uh, a problem, it's just something to keep an eye out for. So these are uh, three I guess of, of the visualization modes that uh, I find particularly useful. Um, as you guys have seen there's a, a ton of other ones that can be useful for debugging how your scene's being split up but these are more of the kind of visual uh, sort of how Enlighten is actually kind of looking at your, your textures, how Enlighten is looking at your uh, actual lighting. So we have the albedo which essentially Enlighten is kind of dumbing down all of your textures, all of your crazy noisy detailed textures into saying okay this is pretty much the albedo that I'm getting out. So usually this is really not a problem like those bricks on the wall there, you know it doesn't matter that I don't have those little black bits of grout, it's kind of, it's good enough to do, to do the GI with. Uh, the emissive pass again, same idea, um, it's as you can see here this little kind of uh, emissive strip here at the bottom of the bar uh, is being kind of approximated to be this kind of you know chunky little jaggedy line that's basically because of the resolution that I'm using. It, could, it would be much better with higher resolution but again it's, it's basically good enough that that's going to be, that's going to be good to approximate with the lighting that should be happening. Uh, and the, the third one I have here is my personal favorite that I use uh, a lot when, uh, when lighting levels is the radiance pass. So this is essentially taking all of the indirect lighting, uh, so that's from your, uh, from direct lights that are hitting your scene as well as emissive surfaces. So you can really clearly see that I have this like orange strip here that's casting this really nice hot glow into the scene and kind of like falling off smoothly and sort of intermingling with the purple uh, strip on the side. So this, this mode is really good to like just distill exactly what Enlighten is doing. When you look at the final frame, you can you, you can see what's happening, but when you have like post processing, you have you know reflection probes, all this kind of stuff, it's harder to tell like what is Enlighten exactly doing, and it, it really is important to understand that because if you're using it, you, ideally you should really understand like you know what what it's doing for your scene. So I'm gonna kind of end off here with just some some various screenshots from. Uh, yeah, they're bright enough. Okay, <laughs> some screenshots from from throughout uh, our environment. Um, so in, in each of these, you know, I've broken it into direct lighting on the left, the raw kind of uh, radiance output, and the final frames. So you can you can really get a get a good sense for how much of the lighting is really being driven from uh, bounce light. Um, of course, if you need four, you could sort of like use like an average kind of ambient value that would, you know, maybe look okay in certain places, but you have a scene like this or this little restaurant here where if that had a really bright uh, ambient it's going to look totally off. Uh, it's not going to make any sense whereas that might work for the top one. So it really just takes the guesswork out of uh, you having to like overly hand tweak these uh, you know these parameters and really it would be impossible to 
to do uh, for for the for the performance costs that we're doing it, it would be impossible to kind of fake this stuff with with point lights. Uh, all right, I think that's uh, that's the end of my bit. So if you are interested in Palin, you want to learn more, you can check out our website, uh, follow us, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs>
but it's not something that's that's coming in the immediate future. Right now, we're focusing on on fixing bugs, stabilizing, and, and upgrading to the new version of Enlighten. Thank you. There's one all the way over there. Hi, um, so question about the light probes. You explicitly said that a grid is a bad idea. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, that's because uh, we don't interpolate in a grid. We interpolate from a tetrahedra. And if you do a grid, it's going to be really hard for us to make nice looking uh, tetrahedra in there. So you will get, uh, you will get higher performance because interpolation and, and stepping through the tetrahedral uh, structure is, is faster. So it's, it's both a quality and a, and a performance. Uh, from, from both a performance and a, and a quality standpoint, you will get better results with the uh, tetrahedra. If you look in the, in the slides, there's a link to uh, Robert Kupit's talk from uh, GDC about uh, tetrahedral inter interpolation of light probes. And it is slowly becoming the standard of, uh, of how to do light probe interpolation. I've seen several other studios adopting this technique because it really works well and, and it's, it's fast. OK, um, and one more question about the meta pass. So if I'm writing my own shaders and I add me a meta pass, and then when I make the build, I have fully baked um, light maps, do I need to take any precautions to exclude the meta pass from the build, or is that done automatically? No. The, um, the meta pass is stripped from the build if you are using fully baked GI, so you don't have to take care of that yourself. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I'm a total beginner with a GI engine, and I have a simple question. If you have a white room where you pre-baked, uh, pre-computed the real-time GI, can you add, at runtime, can you add an object to the scene and see maybe a green object or something and see the bounced light from that object? Or do you have to recompute everything? Uh, so part of what makes Enlighten work is the fact that the environment is static. Those form factors that are between the clusters are pre-calculated offline. Um, so while you can't add new items of geometry to a scene when you're already running the game, you can put a, a proxy geometry in and change the color of it. So you can leave a table in the room, and you can turn it red, you can turn it blue. Um, Gameplay-wise, you could set your entire level uh, in, in a happy place, and you can swift a switch, put the player into angry mode, and all the albedos of the walls change, all everything turns red, and suddenly the lighting is a mean, angry red, and you can flick back and now you're in like happy blue lighting and so on. So you have control over surface materials, you have control over lighting. Um, in Enlighten 302, you have the ability to turn objects transparent. Um, and the utility of this is that if you know at some point in your game that the player character is going to build an object there, then you can include it in the radiosity solution, but make it transparent until the player activates the magic obelisk or, or does whatever you need to do. Um, this is a bit more work on your part because you're tracking the, the visible state of the material as much as anything else. Um, and it's something that we're looking at how best to expose in, in Unity in some upcoming release. And I'm being looked at because we haven't decided when that's coming out quite yet. Hey, um, just made the switch to Unity 5.1 for our studio. Uh, I'm looking to increase our iteration or decrease our iteration time for for uh, uh, light mapping, and I'm still figuring out how to how to handle Enlighten compared to Beast. Uh, we're seeing massive baking times days, and some of it is probably misconfigured. We picked up some new things here that we should change. Hardware-wise, are we talking only cores, clock speed? Does GPU help virtualized versus like? on metal like what do we how do I increase my baking speed so from a from a pure scene configuration view the most important thing seems to be the resolution and the number of things that you throw at Enlighten so consider using probes for for smaller objects that are important 
but the most over, the overall the most important factor is, is resolution. So if you have a giant level, try and, and use a lower resolution. That 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 is the very first thing to look at. Hardware-wise, it's purely CPU baking right now. So a big GPU is only going to give you maybe a few seconds because the meta pass is generated on the GPU, but that is a really fast operation because your scene renders at real time rates already, so we can render it in light map space in the same amount of time roughly. So concentrate on core count and make sure that you have uh, enough memory to fit everything there so you don't start swapping to disk. And the GI cache can range to up, you can you can use a really large GI cache if you have large scenes. So put that on an SSD drive. Uh, that will also give you something. If, if um, but most important is, is is the actual scene itself, configuring it in a, in a way so you don't get these massive peak times. Okay, thanks. Good. And then the GI cache does that grow? How how far should that grow? The default is 10 gigs. Is that yeah, sensible? The, the default is is set at something that is sensible for small levels, but if you have a massive level, then we can generate a lot of data real quick, and you, we might get, around, get to a point where we have to evict some of the data that was recently used, and then you start seeing rebakes every time you open the scene. If you get to that point, you should increase the cache size, but it's not really a one size fits all. Some people get angry that we fill up their uh, SSD with uh, a lot of data that they don't think they need. So it, it's a very individual thing. If you can, if you can afford it, put it on a separate SSD drive somewhere and, uh, and max it out. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. We will be over in Speaker's Corner for another half an hour or so. And I know that most of us will be around in the Ask the Experts section if there's any else you need. Um, thank you all for coming. And cheers.